and welcome to another edition of IWF's Digital Programming. We are hosting weekly events highlighting the global accomplishments of women in policy, in technology, uh, in culture, and many other fields. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Jean Meserve. I've been working with IWF for the past six years to develop and deliver programming. Uh, this is a significant week. We're celebrating two big events. One is the 50th anniversary of Earth Day. The other is the 30th anniversary of the deployment of the Hubble Space Telescope. And we have the perfect guest to discuss both of these things, Dr. Catherine uh, Sullivan. Um, let me tell you a little bit about Dr. Sullivan. She was one of the first six women selected to be part of NASA's astronaut corps. Uh, she was the first American woman to stage a space walk. Uh, she took three shuttle missions. Uh, one of them deployed the Hubble Space Telescope. Um, she also was an accomplished oceanographer and served as administrator of NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration here in the United States. And of course, her most important accomplishment of all is that she's a member of IWF Ohio. So welcome, Dr. Sullivan. Uh, before we get going, just a couple of housekeeping things. We want all of you to be involved in this conversation. Uh, you can ask questions by pressing the ask a question button. Uh, words at the bottom uh, of your screen. Also there, you can upvote the questions of some of your fellow IWF members to indicate which questions you're most interested in. There is a chat function on the side of your screen. You are able to minimize that. If you press it up near the top, you'll see a downward uh, arrow if you want to compress that uh, and, and see more of the screen and less of the chat. Or obviously you can expand it to see more of the chat so you can interact with your fellow IWF members. Uh, so uh, Kathy, great to have you with us. Welcome. Great to be with you, Jean. Uh, first of all, when we put out an announcement for this session, uh, the subtitle was the most vertical girl in the world. Will you explain what that means? Uh, well, those who know me on this call will know I have a, a very large circle of very irreverent friends. Uh, and as an oceanographer, I've had the opportunity to dive in deep submersibles to a depth of some 8,500 feet in the Pacific Ocean. And of course, as an astronaut, I've flown hundreds of miles above the Earth. And notably, on the mission that we deployed the Hubble Space Telescope, we were roughly twice as high as space shuttles normally go, uh, because that's how high up the telescope needed to be. So a couple of my friends have joked, if you, well, you've been that high, which you know, no other woman's done, you've been that deep, which few have done. And you know that distance in between is a larger vertical range, clearly, than any other woman has ever achieved. And so they dubbed me the most vertical girl in the world. Uh, one of them is very musically inclined. And I think he was hearing the Richard Rogers tune, the most beautiful girl in the world. I think that was in his the back of his thinking. And so he, he picked up a refrain that would go along with that melody. And actually your training as an oceanographer proved useful to you as an astronaut, didn't it? Oh, very much. In fact, it probably was the, the root cause reason that I was selected by NASA. I was, when I was screening for astronaut, I was still in graduate school. Uh, so in fact, the interview to become a United States astronaut was my actual first ever job interview. And astronaut was my starting first very time. high there. Starting very high. Oh yeah, <laughs> starting starting very high. Uh, and that was my first full time job. But the the operational experience of you know planning an expedition. You've got some scientific objectives at sea you want to attain. How does the ship operate? What can it do for you? What are its limitations? What equipment do you need? How do you get that? How do you install that on the ship and make sure it's running? And then going out to sea and getting all the work done, knowing full well, life will not deliver you the circumstances that match your plan. You know, a storm will kick up or some piece of equipment will break. And so on top of all that, that planning and pulling the pieces together to make an expedition plan, you then need a very high degree of adaptability and a continual, continued flexibility in how you deal with the circumstances as they come, but still get done the objectives that you had set originally. And also you trained for space in the water. Well, yes, that too. The, the only way to train specifically for spacewalks uh, is to put on a, a, a spacesuit. It's a, it's a real spacesuit, but one that's been set aside just for this Earth-based training. 
put on a real spacesuit and get into a gigantic swimming pool. Uh, and if you hang enough bits of lead weight on the outside of your spacesuit, you'll become what's called neutrally buoyant. So if someone let you go in the middle of the pool, you would not float to the surface or sink to the bottom and you wouldn't tilt anyway, you would just hover there. And that's you know as if you were weightless. So that's the only way really that you can simulate and get used to what it will be like to move around in a spacesuit in a weightless environment. I want to talk a little bit about the moment we're in now with COVID-19. Uh, globally, more than 170,000 people have, have, uh, have died. Um, millions have gotten sick. It's been devastating to economies. But in the middle of all this bad news, a few glimmers of perhaps good news, um, some of them obvious to us from space. Talk to us a little bit about what we're seeing in terms of levels of pollution. Yeah, so uh, you know, we live in the space age, and thanks to satellites, we have, for the first time in human history, we have the ability to snapshot conditions on the entire planet, essentially instantaneously, and to watch changes over long periods of time. So there are uh, satellites in orbit. These images we're about to show happen to come from an American satellite operated by NASA. One of its instruments can measure um, particulate matter and the chemicals in the atmosphere you know, as it flies overhead. And so you're we're going back and forth here, looking at the Beijing region of China. That's where the yellow and red bits are right now. Uh, the intense yellow and red shows what common levels of nitrogen dioxide pollution are over the Beijing uh, basin area in normal times. And then in the next slide, you'll see the much lower levels that have been measured in the weeks since the virus kicked up as, as economic activity shut down as you know, China went into lockdown. Now, the virus, the pathogen, of course, is a global problem and it's spreading, but these side effects, these social and economic side effects are spreading as well. So here's the same kind of measurement from March and April of last year uh, in uh, Central Europe, Paris, the Low Countries, uh, the Milan and Po Valley industrial region of Italy. And here you see it March to April, same, same set of weeks, but a year later this year. Uh, and you can see how much the, the shutdowns uh, of the economic activity and the daily transportation around the major cities, how that has pulled down the pollution level. You know, you're, you're getting a sense here also of something that we see with our own eyes uh, looking out of the spacecraft window from orbit. Uh, and let me draw your attention either to Madrid, it's a very good example, or Prague. If you go back and forth to the 2019, big hot spot at Madrid, big hot spot at Barcelona, big hot spot at Paris, and then down. And so we see similar fingerprints when we look out uh, from Earth at Earth with our own eyes. We can't see this chemical in the atmosphere with our own eyes, but you see evidence like um, smoke fires and things like that. You can definitely see where there's intense economic activity just with the naked eye looking out of a spacecraft window. All these, so places, that, all these places that you're seeing very bright in the, the colors uh, of pollution, we will also see very, very brightly illuminated at night because the night lights of our planet are excellent tracers of where there are concentrations of, of people and our economic activities. So we've seen this decline in, in pollution levels because of COVID-19, because as you mentioned, people are traveling less, there's less industrial activity. So does that mean that when we have this pandemic under control, that these beneficial effects are going to disappear entirely? Uh, they they will disappear uh, and they will disappear very quickly. This particular chemical, nitrogen dioxide, um, washes through the atmosphere very quickly. I mean, you're you're almost seeing daily variations here. Uh, so within, I would guess, you know, a week or a very short number of weeks of the resumption of commerce, you'll see these nitrogen dioxide levels return to to normal. Now, most countries and most uh, most countries are looking at staging their reopening. So it, it, you know, this was a sharp cutoff to a very abrupt low level. It will probably be a bit of a ramp back up to uh, some resumed level of activity. And, and if indeed you know, businesses have failed or uh, different policies come into play, it, it might become a bit less going forward than it was before. But there are still the same number of people and the same basic 
you know, daily transportation, I, I would expect would pick back up pretty quickly. It does certainly give you a glimpse of what changes in human behavior could do to the environment if we were to make those changes more permanent. Well, absolutely. I mean, you know, this is a technical uh, view from the eyes of a satellite, but one of the other uh, views that's been posted around the internet lately that's really been stunning to me is that there have been similar effects, reduction of particulate pollution in the atmosphere, smog, et cetera, in, in northern India. And many cities there, people living in them for the first time, in some cases, the first time in their lives, they can actually see the Himalaya crest from their city. It's normally been shrouded, there's been enough haze, you could not see to the distant crests. And now you can, and it's a stunning sight. Um, this is just a sample, these, these images that we've been looking at, just a sample of the kinds of things that you can see from a satellite uh, and from space. Uh, talk to us a little bit about the, the range of information that we can gather. Yeah, it's, it is really quite a wondrous thing. And these bits of information percolate into our everyday life in ways that we're not even really conscious of and thinking about anymore. Uh, but if we go to the next slide, just as a bit of a teaser, to give you a sense of all the kinds of uh, insights that we can gain about our planet, uh, again, on an ongoing basis, the whole planet at once, thanks to the space age, because satellites have this perspective on Earth. So this is a rendering, of course, uh, but I've taken an image of the, of the Earth here, and in each of these sections, like a section of grapefruit or orange, in each one, we've overlaid some of the kind of data that can be measured uh, from space. And you know, some of it's kind of obvious, like this one coming up right now, you'd say, well, yeah, I can see clouds from space. I kind of know that. I see that on television every night. Uh, but here's one that's how much precipitatable water, what potential for rainfall is in different parts of the atmosphere. As it moves along a little more, uh, you'll see uh, winds. You know, Who would have thought that you can measure wind speeds in the atmosphere without actually being physically in the atmosphere? And I don't know why it's quite stopped spinning, but in, there we go. There so there's the winds one in blue. Uh, this one is a combination of computer model data and satellite data, but there are the currents of the ocean. Um, here's the, the land surface. Uh, here's the biosphere, the growing parts of the earth. Uh, here's soil moisture. Would you have thought you could measure how much moisture is in your garden soil without touching it and or, or sticking some sensor into it? Uh, yes, you can. And the value, just to drive in on that one particularly a bit more, uh, the value in terms of agriculture and crop forecasting and the ability to look ahead and understand you know, where there might be a crop failure that could jeopardize the food security of millions of people. To have the ability to see and anticipate that months in advance is a huge boon to societies and economies. And so that's the final point I would leave with our audience is uh, thanks to the perspectives of satellites and thanks to decades of detailed research into all these different aspects of our planet and how it works. You bring those two things together and what we have in this era of human history that has never ever existed in human history before, we have the ability to have foresight about what conditions on our planet in our environment will be sometime in the future. You can go look back at the most ancient of cave paintings and see evidence of the human hungering for foresight about what's coming at me. Where will the rains fall? Will I have a crop? Where will the animals be when I next need to kill something to eat? We've always wanted foresight about what's coming at us. And we actually have that in an extraordinary degree about the environmental conditions on our planet, thanks to these instruments and this research. And the final point, we will only keep it if we continue to sustain these monitoring systems and this knowledge base. You, you cannot take the pulse of our planet once and then just recalculate over and over and sustain the foresight that we count on now, whether that's you know your local weather forecast for seven days or something more momentous like a crop forecast for you know the Indian, the Indian rice crop that affects millions and millions of people. And you have some uh, examples of some of the kinds of imagery we can see from space. Let's take a look at those slides and tell us what we're Well, the, yeah, the, these are just the absolutely delightfully glorious uh, astronaut tourist shots, to be honest. This is what we get to see 
uh, and when we look out the window of a spacecraft. So uh, we just looked at the pollution map over Europe, and this one is very apropos. Uh, you're sort of roughly over Switzerland here, and you're looking to the northwest. The big concentration of lights at the right is uh, you know the Amsterdam, the Low Countries, Amsterdam and Rotterdam, uh, and across the little dark bit is England. You see the big bright white spot of London, and then the triangle of cities up in the industrial Midlands. And then just beyond that, you're seeing the coastal lights uh, of Ireland. And I will draw your attention also to the blue arc in the upper right-hand corner and the little green arc above that. Uh, that is the atmosphere of our Earth. It's, uh, we think of the atmosphere as immense. It can blow us around and knock us off our feet. But it's, it's more like the shell on an egg than it is some gigantic structure. It's, or, or like the skin on our body. It is the skin of our planet. It's very... And it is one of the organs of our planet. It does all sorts of complex things that make life on the surface of the earth possible. So that's just to illustrate to you what I mentioned before about how vividly you can see where we concentrate and where we work when you fly around at night. Uh, the next slide is uh, a different panorama. Um, you know, it's one of the marvelous ancient, most ancient and most civilized and most historic and also most fraught regions of the world. So this is the lower right-hand corner of the Mediterranean Sea. That's the blue at the top. Uh, the little squiggly bit coming up the left is the Nile River branching out into the Nile Delta, that dusty green color. The two arms of the sea in blue in the foreground are the Gulf of Sinai on the left, the Gulf of Aqaba on the right. So you've got Egypt to the left, the Sinai Peninsula in that wedge. If you look up to the Gulf of Aqaba, the arm that sticks up to the right, you can see there's sort of a line that goes off the tip of that uh, into another body of water. That's the Dead Sea and the Sea of Galilee. And that's, um, that's one of the major fault zones of the Middle East that goes right on up through Syria and into Turkey. A final point to make here is just to the left of the um, little dot of water that is the Dead Sea, you can see an area where the light tan colors suddenly become sort of a grayish green. And it's a pretty straight line where they meet each other. Uh, you're actually seeing visibly from space with your own eye, uh, the 1973 treaty boundary between uh, Israel and, and Egypt. So you can't, you can see signs of human activity and the lines that we draw because we're mad at each other or we want to distinguish my stuff from your stuff. Um, and actually a fair number of those borders that we draw stand out even from space. So here's a big sweep of a fabulously historic region uh, you know, the next orbit around the planet, you might get the following view, which is a much more detailed, straight down look at Jerusalem. Uh, and I, I'm not going to try to get everybody oriented to where we are in this picture. It's a lot of complex topography, as everyone who's been to Jerusalem would know. Uh, but at the very left, you'll see a little white smudge of a cloud with a dark shadow just below it. And if you move straight to the right from that dark shadow, you'll see uh, sort of a diamond shaped lighter, lighter beige area than the rest. And it's got a square in it. Uh, the lighter beige area is the old city of Jerusalem and the square is the Temple Mount. Very cool. And then, you know, so that's fascinating to look at the civilization and think about the history and all the layers of, of uh, earth history. And for me, geologic history that you see in those big sweeps. But another, another endlessly fascinating experience is just to look at, at the artistry of our Earth. And so this, is, this could be just an abstract painting. It's you know wonderful, crazy scene. And it just I find I just looked at it and start wondering, well, wait, what's going on here? Um, and I always use this as a geography quiz when I'm speaking to live audiences. We, we won't do that here. But clearly the white is snow. And if you look really carefully, you can see some fine scaled patterns in the snow itself that are their drainage patterns. They are where little streams would normally flow. But the crazy question is, well, what are those crazy straight lines and the jagged lines? And some of them go all across the whole frame and some start and then stop. Uh, this is in the this is in central Russia on the steppe. Uh, and every green line you see on there is a. Is a, is, a wind, is a row of trees or vegetation. Uh, the big open ones are cutting out or carving out uh, grazing areas. 
and the zigzaggy one that cuts across the frame is a gigantic windbreak. Several rows of vegetation have been planted to slow down the winds and hold on to the topsoil that's so important to this region. And then for a completely con wild contrast, we'll go to more of a desert region in central Australia, and you see this just wonderful abstract pattern uh, of sand dunes, bright red sand against this more weathered, uh, you know, grayish surface between the dunes. Uh, these look kind of like small little sand ripples, but they are tens of meters high, every one of those dunes, if, if not even higher. Kathy, there are now uh, more than 70 nations, I think, who have space programs. Um, a lot of private industry getting involved in at least the launching of satellites. Is it getting too crowded up there? Yeah, it is pretty crowded up there. The authorities, the um, government authorities that track objects in orbit, uh, and they, they do this just as traffic control and collision avoidance, I think they're currently tracking something north of something greater than 20,000 uh, individual distinct objects. And they can track things down to you know, about the size of a soccer ball, uh, a European football. Uh, so if there, there are 20,000 of those, but anytime something bumps into another thing in space, since everything is going so very, very fast, those two things will shatter each other. And so two, two objects this big, if they hit, will become a cloud of thousands or millions of smaller particles down to very, very small size. Uh, and I did a calculation once, intuitively would say, so there's something floating around up there that's the size of a blueberry. Peter, I don't care. But at the speeds that are involved, if you got hit by a blueberry that was going at the speed of, uh, of something in orbit, it would feel like an anvil dropped on you. So there are, and there are millions of poppy seeds and blueberries and you know, softballs, grapefruit flying around up there that can do tremendous damage to larger objects. There's no known way yet to go swoop them up or scavenge them out. So that, that, that's space debris. It is already a very worrisome problem. It's, the concern is that it becomes so much of a hazard barrier that you can't get more stuff into orbit safely. And now, of course, there's a movement uh, principally in the private industry towards what are called small sats, things that are you know, twice the size of your laptop computer, something on that order. So they're inexpensive, they can be launched quickly, they can be launched in batches. One US company just launched 60 of them on one launch yesterday, and they're aiming towards a constellation of them that's tens of thousands. So that's you know, one man's super constellation of really cool small sats that delivers internet globally across the planet is another man's space debris problem. And, and that space debris poses a threat to satellites that are providing us with GPS navigation and everything else that we rely on, but also even to the space shuttle. Hasn't the shuttle had to take uh, evasive uh, moves or the space station had to take evasive moves to try and avoid some of this stuff? Yeah, both shuttle and station uh, have had to do that on occasion. And that's mainly, again, the larger objects that you know are nearby because you can one can do the mathematics to calculate that one will get this close to you, you might want to maneuver. You can't do any of the mathematics on the blueberries and the poppy seeds and the grapefruit because you don't know where they are. So mm -hmm. you're just taking your chances on this cloud of blueberries and poppy seeds and uh, grapefruit that are up there. Um, it's a little more complex than what you said because satellites like GPS are at a, at a particular altitude and in a particular mm -hmm. geometry that these super small satellites largely are not going to be in. So they're not a hazard to absolutely everything, but they are, they are in a sense a hazard to anybody who wants to launch because if they tend to be at lower orbits, your next communication satellite that needs to go out to the geostationary orbit, it's gotta get through that barrier. It's gotta, and it can't zig its way through these particles. It's gotta take its chances as it blasts through that cloud of stuff that it doesn't bump into one of them. And is there any um, mechanism for space governance or is it the Wild West? Well, there are some significant mechanisms for space governance that have grown up over the early decades of the space era, but they have all been intergovernmental. So governments to governments meeting to decide um, how are we going to use the radio spectrum, the airwaves that we use for our 
our broadcast radio on our cell phones and our Wi-Fi? How are we going to divvy that up so that any any given use is not interfered with by other ones? Uh, and similarly with uh, orbits and launch protocols and safety. The trick now, or I guess the it, it is right now more Wild West because none of the intergovernmental rules apply to private entities. They were they never anticipated that you know Joe Schmo will be able. This will become so inexpensive that Joe Schmo and Kathy Sullivan can start a space company and do what they want. So that that's got to get sorted out and sorted out in uh, relatively short order, or we really could have a mess on our hands. Um, you have a new book out. Let's talk about that. Hand sure. On Hubble. So tell us why you wrote the book. Uh, well, I wrote the book because, well, a little bit of backstory. My second mission was the one that took the Hubble to orbit. But my work leading up to that mission ended up spanning five whole years and was focused on making sure that we had all of the tools and equipment that would be required to repair and maintain Hubble in orbit during the course of its lifetime. NASA had made the promise that astronauts would be able to do that. Uh, but when I started working on Hubble with my crewmate in 1985, uh, Hubble itself had been designed to make that maintenance possible, but none of the equipment had really been built. So this whole chapter of Hubble's history, you know, how did it come about that the telescope was designed with an architecture that made it maintenance friendly. And, and how did it come about that, and that you had the tools and equipment? There's never been a telescope like this in space before. Uh, when this all starts up, there haven't even hardly been astronauts before. So how did people figure out how to do this? And then who were the engineers that actually designed these tools and created them and made sure they would work? That, the, that chapter of the Hubble history has been overlooked. It's not been told anywhere. And more importantly, the people who did this maintenance preparation work, they are really the people that are the reason why Hubble is running today. And their story had never been told. They've never been given their due. Uh, I worked alongside them for five years and I wanted to, I, I wanted to fill in that gap in history and give them their proper uh, regard. And so I wrote my story of becoming an astronaut and working at NASA in order to bring that story into the foreground. And we have some slides that show the process. Let's look at those. Yeah, the process and some of the other stories I threw in, uh, because this is, I, I kind of think of this book as a two-stranded memoir. There's the Kathy Sullivan memoir and there's the Hubble Telescope memoir. Um, this is a scene from the Kathy Sullivan memoir. Uh, it's October 5th, 1984. Sally Ride and I are waiting our turn to load into the space shuttle Challenger. That's uh, just over Sally's shoulder to the right is the hatch. And uh, just the way we were seated in the cockpit meant that Sally and I would get into the vehicle last. So we're standing around in this little vestibule, this little white room that you see, and we're keenly aware that there are cameras all around us watching our every move. This is the first time two women are gonna be on a spaceship. It's, you know, the media is making a very big deal out of this. And it, suddenly we looked at each other and said, it's probably a little weird that we're just standing here with nothing to do. We should probably look like we have something important to do. And so we thought, well, you know, we've seen a lot of space movies. You always synchronize your watches before some big event. So let's pretend we're synchronizing our watches. Uh, and so we actually are pretending to synchronize our watches here. But to our, to our absolute delight, when we returned from the mission and all the press clippings had been saved for us, this photo was prominent on front pages of many, many newspapers. And the caption, without exception, the caption read, Kathy Sullivan and Sally Ride synchronized their watches before boarding the Space Shuttle Challenger. So we were thrilled to have scored a little minor victory. Excellent. I can tell you that news anchors do this too, when they have the shot of people on set, uh, you know, and they're kind of playing the announcement, this is the whatever nightly news. Very often the anchors are bantering with someone else in the studio with them and saying something totally inappropriate. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so, you, you gotta you gotta add some humor when you can. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so now let's look at some of the Hubble shots if we can. Yeah. So 1985, I finally get to meet Hubble. That's the real telescope on the left in this hyper clean room where it was assembled and built. Uh, the little dots at the lower left of that picture are people, just to give you a sense of the scale. 
its um, you know tourist bust size uh, spacecraft. And on the right, I, I put this uh, artist concept into the book just to give people a sense of all the different pieces and parts and electronics boxes and instruments that could be removed and replaced to keep Hubble, not only keep it running if something broke, but keep it keep it state of the art, keep it cutting edge. So just like we do with our cell phones nowadays, if the detectors that um, the detectors you would put into an astronomical camera got better as technology went on, well, I want to be able to take the old Hubble camera out and put a new one in that's got that new detector. Uh, so all these instruments and electronics bits were, they were basically mounted in closets and kitchen cabinets. That's the easiest way to think about them. You see some of the doors shown open there. And we needed to create the wrenches and clamps and brackets and things that would let astronauts, two astronauts wearing like gigantic snowmobile suits and clumsy mittens and a bucket over your head. Uh, I want you to go be able to remove and replace any of those things. Uh, you don't just run down to your local high street hardware store and find these gadgets. They actually had to be invented. So there were really two parts to doing this work. The next slide shows part one, which is just figuring out the choreography. I've got two astronauts and I've got five things that need to be replaced. Who moves where, when, you know, when do you take the old one out? When do you put the new one in? Um, it, this all had a lot of technical background to it. Like the, these boxes can't stay outside too long. They'll get too cold. So you have to get this done in a certain time frame. What's the efficient choreography to get it done in the, in a current time frame? These so scenes are both taken in those large water tanks that we were talking about earlier. Uh, in the scene on the left, I'm actually the astronaut uh, in the center of the frame. In the scene on the right, I'm in the spacesuit on the right side of the frame. So, you know, you're, you can get the choreography down here. You can get accustomed to working in this environment and how you'll be able to move. Uh, the scene on the right gives an example. We could, here we were testing, where do I need a handle? I need to have a handle on this box if I'm going to be able to move it around. Where does that need to be, considering how our geometry will be? It sounds like simple stuff, but you've got to get the timing so efficient that you really need to refine this over and over. And everything we would come up with that we needed to help us would have to go back through a bunch of engineering analysis to make sure that temperatures and weight and everything else were still uh, okay. So that's, you know, figure out the choreography. The other thing is let's make sure the tools actually really work. Uh, and the next slide illustrates that. Um, and we've, I think we've probably all had experience where we thought we had the right screwdriver or wrench or something and you go, oh, it doesn't fit. Well, these guys can't run off to the hardware store. Every tool in this toolkit has to fit and has to work for every astronaut that might ever go work on Hubble. And so you see a couple of scenes here. Again, that's on the right, that's me on the far right with one of the wrenches that we built to operate the solar arrays. Uh, I actually almost had to do this on a spacewalk in orbit for real in, in 1990 when something went slightly wrong on the Hubble during deployment. And on the left, that looks like just a random set of pliers that we're using to undo this electrical cable. Uh, but there was no such plier on the planet that could get into these tight spaces and put the amount of force needed onto those connectors. So one of our very clever tool designers named Michael Withy uh, had to come up with a way that would work with the spacesuit glove and with your bulky helmet on and still let you reach into those tight spaces and remove, you know, it, six connectors here, but in other cases, 35 or 36 connectors at a time. I think the next one we show um, sort of the elegant scene from, from my Hubble flight. This is just moments after we let it go. That little soda straw like thing that sticks up uh, little is a robotic arm. That's what we had used to lift Hubble out of the bay. And Steve Hawley has just moments ago released the handle and pulled the arm a little bit away from Hubble and Lauren Shriver, our mission commander, in another moment is going to fire the space shuttle's engines to back the shuttle away from Hubble. One of the ironic bits of my own story is after working on Hubble for five years and just salivating to see this moment, the spectacular moment where we put Hubble into orbit, uh, I was instead sealed inside my spacesuit and sealed inside the airlock um, just in, in that little white Look at the very bottom of the frame, you see the white forward part of the space shuttle with two little square windows in it. 
right below those windows, I was locked in a little tin can because we almost ended up outside on a spacewalk. So instead of watching this scene live in real time, I was staring at a very sterile blank white wall. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, um, them's the breaks. And I think many of us will remember that at least initially, Hubble didn't really live up to expectations. It did not. and. Uh, we were, we were uh, that was driven home to all of us in NASA very vividly as the next slide shows. Uh, Hubble and NASA became targets of just scathing ridicule. Every late night talk show host in the United States had a field day using us for comedy. Uh, you see one of the magazine covers at the time on the left. And I think the best quote I found of the public reaction uh, was someone who was writing in a popular mechanics, I think it was, this gorgeous, glorious, elegant thing you've been waiting for forever, and it suddenly turns out to be you know, not at all what you wanted. Um, and, and this so is when it became very important that you guys had built it to be maintained in space. That's exactly right. I mean, saving Hubble's site was now as much about saving a $1.5 billion mission as it really was about saving NASA as an agency. It, it was... This was not many years after the explosion of the space shuttle Challenger. And now here's another multi-billion dollar disaster. And it, it seemed to be, there seemed to be serious political jeopardy for quite some time that this might just lead our, the Congress of the United States to throw their hands up and say, we're done. You guys can't do anything right anymore. Um, it's, let's go to the next slide. The problem with Hubble was it's, it's very, it has a very large mirror called the primary mirror. It's 2.4 meters in diameter. That's eight feet for us Americans. Uh, and it has to have a very precise, slightly concave shape. And it was slightly too flat. Like one, you know, think of a page of a hardcover book you've read recently, 1 40th, 4 0, 1 40th the thickness of that page is wow. how much it was off. Wow. But that was enough to make Hubble. Um, to blur Hubble's sight to the to to what you see on the left, that's all the better Hubble could do with the bad mirror at the beginning. And on the right, uh, the the good news about the mistake was it was a very precise mistake. And so, just as my optometrist can calculate very precisely, you know, what lenses need to go in these eyeglasses to correct for the defect in my eye, we could calculate very precisely what correction would restore Hubble's sight. Uh, and a, a box was put in that had that correction in it and fixed the light beams. So on yeah. the right, you see, this is what Hubble could see just moments after you put the eyeglasses on, as it were. Uh, and then as I alluded to, detectors and instruments improve over time, over 10 and 15 and 20 years. And so the next slide gives you a sense of how much better still the third generation camera is than even or the fourth generation, excuse me, than the second generation. So it's eyesight improved and showed us just amazing things. These it, beautiful photographs. Spectacular but, structures that you know we've never been able to see and an understanding of, of star nurseries where stars are born, how galaxies form and evolve. Um, you know, black, black holes were believed to be kind of rare things. We now understand that black holes are at the center of virtually every major galaxy. I mean, just a, an amazing string of discoveries. One of my all-time favorites is the final image we have. Uh, astronomers at one point thought Hubble can see very far and can see very dim things. Uh, let's point it at a patch of sky that, as far as we can tell, is empty you know, with, with existing telescopes. It seems to be empty. Let's point Hubble at that and let's allow it to stare for a very long time and see if, there's, if it's really empty. And this is one of the images that came from that exercise. Uh, and what I would point out to you, you see all the pinpricks of light in this image. If you look carefully, you'll see two that have a little cross coming out of them. One's just lower center, one's uh, upper center, slightly to the right. Those two points of light are stars. Every other point of light in this image, thousands of them, every other one is a galaxy. It's a whole nother Milky Way like our galaxy. Thousands of galaxies where we thought the sky was just empty. Wow. 
just a beautiful image and amazing to think how much science has has resulted, how much knowledge has resulted uh, from this telescope, which, as I mentioned very early on, 30th anniversary of its launch this week. Um, um, when NASA designed and, uh, and got Congress's approval to do Hubble, uh, NASA promised it would operate for 15 years. So it's, it's running at twice its intended, twice its promised lifetime. And, and it has clearly improved with age, not just the detectors, which I've shown you, uh, but every, every piece of electronics on Hubble is better, faster, more reliable, uh, higher bandwidth, more data storage than it was when it launched. So, you know, I mean, you and I have improved with age also, Gene, but this, of is, sort of, this, is, this is a really different kind of example. <laughs> um, I want to work in some of the audience questions because they're pouring in here. Um, Elizabeth asks, how would you assess the state of women in science and the growth of education for and with girls in science fields? What are the three most important actions needed going forward? What do you think? Oh, I with the caveat that I can only give uh, an American perspective on this. Um, uh, the, there's been significant advancement, but in my view, far slower uh, and still more meager than it should have been. Uh, in some fields in the United States, uh, the, the demographic is 50-50 uh, male and female, notably in the biological and life sciences. In others, uh, in sort of archetypal physics and engineering, the percentages are still very low. Uh, if I look in the space arena, it's, I'm a little more encouraged there. There are now women in, not just in technical fields, but in positions of authority, executive authority and responsibility. Uh, NASA has had a deputy administrator. Uh, several of its major operating units have been run by women. Space shuttles and space stations have been commanded by women. Mission control has been run by women. And there are senior women in a number of the uh, startup uh, small space companies. So. That, that's kind of encouraging. Um, what needs to be done, uh, I would put my finger on a, a couple of things. One is every infant, every baby is born a natural inquirer and scientist. And somehow early schooling beats that out of them. So we've got, we've got to somehow get to where we're encouraging and, and continuing to foster the curiosity and the adaptive uh, interactive learning that is natural to young children instead of beating it out of them from grades you know, one through seven, and then suddenly in middle school or high school, as we call it in the States, suddenly wanting to get interested in science again. With respect to girls, um, the time frame in which, the time frame in which um, schooling will normally start to give you the beginning foundations of a career in science is usually the time frame where girls' social development is really picking up as well. Uh, and where boys are becoming a little more into their own. And so young girls often face this quandary, of, I can either be smart or popular, but not both. Uh, and you get all sorts of signals, I remember this happening to me, that it's it's really not cool to always have your hand in the air and be eager to answer questions in class. That's kind of not what the cool kids do. So those social pressures at that key age of 12, 13, 14, uh, finding ways, families and, and maybe school groups and scouting, find, find ways to get girls past those sort of moments. Uh, and then finally, uh, in the United States, many more students start college stating that they want to go into the sciences than you find finishing. So the early scientific education in, the, in American universities uh, is also sending people away. The few the low percentage of students that finish a science degree basically do it in spite of the crummy teaching, in spite of really horrible uh, first two year experiences. So we've got to get to where we're focused on interactive learning, not didactic schooling. Tall uh, order. I think all of us who are parents have witnessed this firsthand. You know, when yeah. science came about how to format a lab report, I saw my kids just totally turn away from it. But you know, Jean, Jean, let me let me add one other point there that you just reminded me of. And again, this is I know this from my experience as an American. It may not be universally true, uh, but the mindset in the United States seems very much to be science is something you're either good at or not. And if you're not good at it, you know, go with your passion, find something you like. 
And it, it, many other club, countries and cultures, it is recognized that science is a muscle like any other. And the more you, you can develop to much greater extent than you might have been the first time you try it, just like you can do with singing or playing piano or anything else. So to switch to seeing science as a muscle you can improve and develop and one that is vital to your future in, in the times that we live in. And for parents, especially mothers in the United States, stop saying, that's all right, honey, mommy wasn't any good at math either. You just gave your daughter a pass to say you will turn out just fine if you ignore science and math. That might have been true for a mother, for my mother in the 50s, or a mother in the It's not true for kids growing up in this time frame. We've got to stop giving them an out. Uh, we have another question. Part of it you've answered. It was about uh, the number of women in senior positions in NASA. But the rest of the question is, as a woman, how were you treated in NASA? Were you treated uh, as an equal? Uh, we, I would say the first six of us got a very good run when we came into NASA. Uh, and I attribute that to a number of things. One is there, there were six of us, so it was sort of a critical mass, not one lone weird outlier. Um, our classmates, the, uh, all the men in our class, uh, they, we knew and they knew that we had come through the same process. We've been trained and screened in the same way. No one got in cheap. No one snuck in the side door. Uh, but the other thing is, think about this. We, we walked into a large complex organization with the most prestigious title that the organization can bestow. Uh, it would be like walking into an army with four stars of a general on your shoulder. And so we certainly now and then met people, met men who'd been there a long time and they'd, they'd dealt with astronauts, but they'd never seen an astronaut that looked like me before. But they, you know, they would quickly say, I know how I always treated astronauts. I know how, I know what happened if I ever didn't treat an astronaut that way. So we got, you know, we got a runway to work with. We got, we then had to live on our track record. Now you got to prove yourself and show your stuff. Uh, but I think, you know, if you come in as the most junior person there, uh, new kids and junior people often get a lot of um, hazing and teasing. You sort of join the club teasing. Uh, and if you're different, in addition to being new, you're probably going to get a more intense version of that for a whole host of reasons. Uh, we have another question, this one from Michelle. Uh, she asks, science is under attack for both COVID-19 and climate change. What is being done? What can we do to counter this? Your thoughts? Uh, well, I think it's a particularly American phenomenon, not, uh, not a global one. Uh, it's been going on for, it's been a trend that's been going on for quite some time. Um, and it, you know, I believe it has very deep roots in, in American culture. It's a to challenge and a skepticism about expertise generally. And as science has become germane to things that touch more and more people's lives, you get more and more uh, pushback uh, about, you know, I want to do it my way. Who are you, who are you to tell me what to do? So it, it goes straight on against American individualism, Americans sense of individual liberty and a whole host of things. I don't have a magic solution to it. I think the, the eras in the um, history of the United States where this has happened before, uh, it has usually taken some significant shock uh, to you know, move people in a new direction, uh, reestablish some sense of, of the necessity of common purpose uh, and reawaken people to uh, uh, avenues and ways in which having expertise really can help with something that they care about as opposed to Having, expert, having expertise is now the reason you're telling me not to smoke or the reason you're telling me to stay home or the reason you're telling me to do something else. How about expertise that I don't object to? It kind of boils down to that. Uh, Becky asks, having been in space, do you think there is life on other planets? If so, when do you think we will find evidence of that? Uh, I, I think it's in, impossibly, utterly impossible that there's not life elsewhere in the universe. That's just, just implausible that there isn't. Uh, even just given the things we found here on this planet in the last couple of decades about where life exists, 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 exists that we never imagined it would exist, um, it is most likely that that life out there, if it exists, is bacterial or viral. Um, you know, you don't, don't go expecting to see some little critter that comes up to you and has a business card and a BMW. Uh, even on this planet, the most abundant forms of life are viruses and bacteria. 
So I think that's quite plausible. I think we might well find it. We could well find it on Mars, less likely on the moon. And the interesting question to me is, so we find it. We get there and scientists say, we have found it. We have found life on Mars. And the next sentence is, it's a bacterium. That's not how the science fiction story is supposed to end, right? It's supposed to be some glorious form of life. I think, I think when most people contemplate the question of is there life out there, they have some more magnificent life form in their mind's eye, and that's not likely to be what we discover. So will we still feel it as a momentous discovery when we find a bacterium somewhere, or will we be crestfallen that it's sort of, oh, man, I thought it was going to be something cooler than that. Of course, the other scenario is in science fiction is that it's something dangerous. Bacterium could potentially be that, correct? It Well, it could. I mean, this uh, current virus is titled the novel coronavirus for a reason. There have been coronaviruses around for a long time. We've dealt with several of them in past years, SARS and MERS. This one is novel. It's new. We, we don't recognize this one. We don't know it yet. We don't we do know its genome now, but we don't know all its characteristics. And so it's a much larger cloud of uncertainty and risk. Uh, Linda asks, my 12 year old daughter is interested in becoming an astronaut. Any advice for her? Um, it's just gonna sound like silly advice, but it's actually a formula that I remember using from uh, about her age onward. Uh, if she can, if she considers herself to be an astronaut in astronaut training now, and recognizes that every day at school is her opportunity to add more knowledge and more skills to her own toolkit, turn so turn school around. It's not something parents are forcing you to do. It's not something teachers are requiring you to do or, or laying on you. It's it's your learning platform, uh, and build you know build that learning muscle. Uh, that's one sure way to go at it. Um, be ready for the time frame, probably in the next couple of years, where the fact that you're smart and you're going to go into the sciences uh, and work on your science and math, and you've got this bold dream. If you haven't met them already, I guarantee you will meet people that just throw rocks at that. That's crazy. That silly girls don't do that. Whatever. You'll hear that. Um, so be ready for that and understand that that's just their opinion and they do not get to edit what you're interested in. They do not get to edit the dream that you're pursuing. They can have their opinion, they probably will, and they'll probably say it loudly, and so what? Julie Hall asks, I've read a lot about the overview effect that many astronauts experience. Have you, what was your experience? Was it life-changing? How did, did it change your world universe view? For those who don't know, first explain what the overview effect yeah, I forget at the moment the name of the uh, author who first used that phrase as a, a book title, uh, but it was a sort of amusing over, the author was amusing or exploring, examining uh, whether getting that, getting far away from Earth, and he was talking in particular about the Apollo astronauts, but to, to zoom back that far and see this planet that we've lived on for our whole lives in such a different perspective uh, does what impact does that have emotionally or spiritually or psychologically on people that have that opportunity? Um, I think for me, this is sort of a complex set of intertwined strings. Um, I, I think one, you definitely are changed by going out on a space flight and coming back. Partly you're changed by the process and experience you go through to get there. I mean, it's you have to be 200% invested in something that is bigger and bigger than and beyond you. So all in, but something that's much beyond you and that you will not and do not have full control over. And, and you know, that committing to something like that, I think uh, that's a transformative experience in its own right. The view out the window, seeing the whole, basically the whole planet in, in that very different way. Uh, I think it, it certainly shifts everybody's perspectives to some degree or another, but the differences are quite individual. I think people, I, I, my own crewmates, if they were devoutly religious before, it reconfirmed, you know, the glory of deity and the the um, the, um, the the divine nature of creation. If they were not, it was it it didn't. Um, so it, I. 
was enamored with Earth and maps from a young, young age. So in terms of the geography overview effect, um, I maybe maybe I was a little more familiar with global geography before I got there than some of my crewmates. Uh, and I found it illuminating. It, it illuminated things, areas and places and things I knew. And it, it, it showed me, as, the, as every good experience will do, it showed me questions and dimensions I hadn't even thought to look for or think about. Uh, but so I'm a bit of a skeptic on the overview effect. I'm not sure it's just looking out the window so much as it is the whole experience of making the journey to that unique place. Anna asks a question for this moment. Can you give us advice about how to live in confinement and still be both productive and calm? Well, it's, you can't expect to live life like you know, continue being who I was like I was before we have these constraints. But what I always found was you know, be fully present where you are, uh, find things around you in your right now uh, that do please you, that you are in, in particular, that you are grateful for, that um, you never had before or you have it now. And you find a way to cherish that. Uh, and then I think always look for ways that you can be of help or service to someone else. So there's something really outbound uh, about what you're doing on a day-to-day -day basis, even if it has to be a more virtual connection or you know, dropping something off on a neighbor's porch instead of going in and having a coffee. Um, you know, to, to do those things for those moments where you know you're you know you're giving, you know you're helping, you know you're contributing to something uh, other than just yourself. Um, and I mean, those are the two things that that I found when I was in space. Um, just really absorb and be where you are. And uh, on the stay calm part, you know, it's. Uh, you control the things you can control and, and you find ways to let go of or you know, park them mentally, the things you can't control and you, you'll deal with them when you can, but that's not right now. We have two interrelated questions. Uh, one is what were the physical challenges of training for the astronaut program? The second is what is be being an astronaut done to your physical health? For instance, your bone health, cardiac health, muscle strength, et cetera. Yeah, let me take the second one first. Uh, in my case, it has not, spaceflight has not done much, uh, if anything at all, to my physical health. I, you know, three flights that were five, seven, and 10 days long, those are very brief exposures. So most of the physiological effects that uh, you worry about, um, changes to the optic nerve, bone, uh, bone calcium loss, and so on, um, they, they probably start, they probably get underway in the course of five to 10 days. But very, they make very little progress and they rebound very quickly once you get home. So no lasting effect. Um, and NASA tracks this, by the way. NASA invites every astronaut that's have been in space to come back on an annual basis for an annual physical, you know, not to give away free annual physicals, but so that over time, NASA can gain an understanding of how much spaceflight exposure leads to what sort of follow-on effects as people age so we, we all flew in our 30s or 40s, some of us maybe in our early 50s. Um, does that set you up for a greater incidence of cancer or of problems with your eyes in later years? The only way to know that is to track the people who've been in space as they age through their later years and find out um, how much spaceflight exposure appears to shift your vulnerability to a cancer or to other problems. So I'm free and clear. That's... Uh, my total exposure is way too short to have any meaningful effect. Um, the physical rigors of, of training are, you know, are basically keeping up with a really crazy wild pace, you know, very, very intense days from one simulator to another or from one laboratory or work site to another, uh, lots, lots of travel because as a space flight is being pulled together, uh, different parts of it are being done and, and, places scattered all across the United States and sometimes around the planet. So your stamina to keep up with the pace of the training flow is one thing. If you're going to do a spacewalk, um, the, the real spacesuit weighs over 300 pounds. You won't ever have to lift or move 300 pounds, you, but you have to get used to working with that kind of mass. And working in the suit underwater, again, you're not carrying the suit around, but um, you've got to build some muscle strength and in particular some forearm and hand grip strength to 
be able to do a spacewalk. Uh, and then finally, some of the emergency training that we need to do from the shuttle. Uh, you were wearing 90 pounds of gear uh, for launch and landing, and you had to do, uh, again, to protect for emergency scenarios, you now and then had to do things like climb out, the, climb up on the back seat, the back of the seat on the flight deck of the orbiter, out the hatch in the roof of the orbiter and rappel down the side. And, you know, do something like that with 90 pounds of gear on your back, you've got to maintain some good strength there as well. A question about your book. Is it appropriate for middle or high school curriculum? Um, I I think it is. And one of my uh, a friend who is a high school counselor and another who was a college career counselor, and they have both recommended it to their uh, clients and audience. So, I mean, it's, it's written in very storytelling fashion. I've woven some of the technical, you know, how did you invent this tool stuff into the story? If some of that goes over somebody's head, it, it's not going to, it's not going to prevent them getting a lot, I think, out of all the other elements of the story. Um, Kathy, we are almost out of time. I have one question I want to ask you. Um, can you share with us the most thrilling or most memorable moment of being an astronaut? Well, uh, no one will forget their launches or their landings. Those are pretty dramatic. But um, but my, yes, my very, very most personal favorite one is from our spacewalk, which was a, it was pretty short spacewalk, just three and a half hours and choreographed very tightly, as I have said. So we we're really busy all the time. But there was one moment in there, uh, and I write about this in the book, there was one moment where I had to move from one side of the space shuttle to the other side uh, across uh, some instrumentations, instrumentation that was mounted in the cargo bay. And that moment was one that we also wanted to film for an IMAX movie. Uh, and so I was making my way across that pathway and my crewmate, John, was not quite ready with the camera to take the shot. So he came up on the radio and said, hey, you guys, hold on a second, wait there. Uh, I'll let you know when I'm ready for you to move. And that that little moment, it probably was maybe a minute and a half, but that was the one time I could really stop paying attention to uh, where I was maneuvering, where I had my hands, and I could just look around and really take in where I was. And where I was was with my feet, my head was down towards the keel of the orbiter, my feet were pointing up along the vertical fin, and the space shuttle was upside down. So my feet were actually pointing towards Earth. And so I looked away from my hands at, down towards my feet. And I felt like I was a little kid hanging off the limb of a tree in my backyard, except my backyard was 200 miles below me. And it was a piece of Venezuela and the Caribbean sliding by you know, right between the toes of my boots. Uh, that's, uh, I'm delighted that that moment is captured in the IMAX film, The Dream is Alive because it helps me keep it very vivid in my own mind's eye. Quite a backyard. Um, Dr. Sullivan, thank you so, so very much for joining us today to share your experiences and your knowledge and your insight. And thank you to our audience for weighing in with your great questions. Once again, the name of the book is Handprints on Hubble. I know there's been a link shared with you on chat that shows you uh, where you can buy it. So please do, and please all of you stay tuned uh, to the IWF emails, you will be seeing announcements of other digital events that we will be holding in the weeks ahead. So thanks again for joining us. Please, all of you, stay safe and stay healthy. Thank you, Jean, and thanks to everyone for joining. It's been fun.